This is Dan Nussbaum. I'm a professor in the Operations Research Department, as well as the chairman of the Energy Academic Group, which is a cross-disciplinary academic institution looking at issues about energy, including cost-benefit analysis, having to do with advanced energy technology. This is a presentation about the background, and it's also an introduction to the idea of cost-benefit analysis. The topics that I want to cover are listed on this slide. They are the standard what, why, when, and how that one should always introduce. They'll also pick up issues of where you can get more information, that is, sources and references. So let me start with the what of cost-benefit analysis. If you look at these five different examples, you'll see that they represent choice making, whether it's in our private lives, as the first two are, or in our public lives. And mainly these are uh, naval examples. But the second one of the public, the analysis of alternatives for a second producer for JSF engines, there's been a long discussion about whether we should have a second engine vendor for producing JSF vendors or a single one would suffice. And the fight has gone on for about 10 years, all of it fought on the turf of cost-benefit analysis. And on the last bullet, man versus unmanned, this is a story from about a year and a half ago in which the Department of Defense was considering doing a software upgrade to Global Hawk, the so-called Block 30. And it was very expensive. And somebody said, why don't we use U2s? I thought they were kidding because I thought U2s had gone away a long time ago. I actually remember when in the Eisenhower administration there was a U2 incident. Maybe you remember it, and maybe not. The cost-benefit analysis came down, surprisingly, on the side not of the modern, stealthy, unmanned weapon system, but on the side of the 60-year-old manned weapon system. So cost-benefit analysis has very real consequences, and it gets used in our public lives as well as in our private lives. So let's jump into the definition of a cost-benefit analysis. And you can see at the top that, of course, it's a balancing of all costs and all benefits over time. But the important point here is that you take the Army perspective. The Army is a full enterprise. There's always this question of where you stand is where you sit. That is, are you at the installation or post or camp? Or are you at the headquarters DA? Or what perspective are you taking? And the answer is, you should take the Army Enterprise perspective. You can see at the bottom that there are certain values to this balancing of costs and benefits. And one of them is that you end up with a strong value proposition. You've thought through what you're trying to do and how you go about doing it. It's interesting that these analyses, what we're calling a cost-benefit analysis, also has other names. When you read the literature or when you hear people speaking, they'll say things like, and you see it this, this at the bottom, analysis of alternatives, cost-benefit analysis, business case analysis, economic analysis, and so on. And the truth is, these are all the same thing, at least to my way of thinking they're the same thing. They are analytical studies that, that uh, adhere to the four bullets on this slide. That is, they always state a problem that needs to be addressed. And that has to be statable in not too uh, convoluted a fashion. There have to be some choices about how we're going to accomplish the objective. That's the second bullet. And never let people tell you that there's only one way to do the, to do the task. The truth is there's always a status quo, which may be terrible, which may not do the job very well, but it certainly is a course of action. There's always buy a new system, which is often what they want to do. There's always outsourcing, which may be infeasible or expensive or for some reason not good, but it's certainly a choice. That is, there's always a range of alternatives 
that one can put down to address the objective identified in bullet number one. And now here's the hard part, although it's easy to state in bullet number three. What are the full life cycle costs of each of the co courses of action? And what are the benefits of each of the courses of action? And what are the risks associated with each of the courses of action? And finally, after doing that, and that really is a hard part, there's the question of how would you meld those together to come up with a recommended solution? So these four steps are what's, what are common to what we're calling cost-benefit analysis, but which others have other names for, which you see at the bottom of the slide. Now we begin the conversation of why we are doing cost-benefit analysis. The next few slides take us through this. The simple reason for doing a cost-benefit analysis is listed at the bottom of this slide. Producing what is often called a value proposition, a clear statement that the benefits more than justify the costs, the risks, and the trade-offs. But what's important is the, the bullets that are above. That when you're making resource decisions, you have to think of costs, and by the way, I mean life cycle costs, right up front, not later on, oh, we'll put this into the budget and somebody will pay for it. And we also need to consider where the money would come from. It's not as if the Department of Army has excess money just waiting for our program. There are going to be trade-offs, so we should identify where the trade-offs come from, although I recognize that that may often be above our pay grade. You can see on this slide the specific values that cost-benefit analysis brings to the table. Of course, we are all responsible for, for good stewardship of public resources and public finances. Another reason is that they tell us to do it. Here, embedded in regulatory and statutory requirements, and regs and laws, are the requirements to do uh, cost-benefit analysis. And you'll see some of that, you'll see a lot of that, in the resources slides at the very end of this uh, deck of slides. The third reason is that if you underpin analysis with numbers, this is a language that everybody speaks. They may not like your answers, but they know how you got them. And it removes a certain amount of subjectivity, although I agree, not all, from the analysis process. Also, because we're doing this in a thoughtful way, we've listed all the possible courses of action that lead to our objective. And finally, this is very, very useful in the budget business, whether you're justifying budgets or submitting budgets. As if the reasons on the previous slide were not enough, here's a what I would call a they tell me to do it. Now this is a somewhat dated slide and a somewhat dated memo, but uh, it does have the two top two of the top people in the army at the time, uh, the vice chief and the undersecretary, saying roughly what it says in the box on the left that all unfunded requirements and new or expanded program proposals shall be accompanied by a thorough cost-benefit analysis. In other words, they're telling us, do it all the time. Thank you very much. The requirement on the previous slide that says all unfunded requirements should be subjected to a cost-benefit analysis is not meant to be some sort of revolution, but rather more of an evolution, and it's an adaptation of what we currently do. And if you see the second bullet here, it's, it really is what is expected of us, collaborative and thoughtful, problem solving, and analytical rigor. That's important. But this is not supposed to be a great departure from what we're supposed to have been doing in the past. And when should these CBAs be done? Anytime a senior leader, and I agree, senior leader is not a well-defined term, but typically it's somebody who's, uh, whose rank is above yours, is making a decision that influences resources. Or anything that is going to go to senior leadership is going to have to have a CBA attached to it. The portion of this class that I'm providing to you would not be complete unless I gave you answers to the questions here. Uh, what does a quality cost-benefit analysis look like? And uh, a framework for doing it. And uh, where can you go for resources? And things about the, the 
the organizations within the army that are actually overwatching this whole cost benefit analysis process. And that's what I intend to give you on the subsequent slides. There is a group that overwatches cost benefit analyses in the army, and it is within DASA CE, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Cost and Economics. And it is appropriately called the CBA Review Board or the CBARB. What will the CBARB review? Well, when you read down this list, uh, whether it's a uh, temporary uh, program guidance mechanisms or basis of issue plans or, well, as you go down this list, it's almost everything. They have the right to review the CBAs that are done in almost all of the processes that run the Army. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news. It depends upon whether you're an analyst who does this for a living or you're the analyst who has to prepare these uh, analyses. The next three slides, starting with this one, talk about the what, who, and how of the Cost-Benefit Analysis Resource Board. Take a look at the blue box on the left, which talks about the key questions that the CBARB is going to ask. When they review your CBA, they're going to specifically ask these questions. And they're looking for, have you addressed the question of the best value for the Army, the course of action that provides an optimum balance, I'm reading now from the bottom right, of performance, cost, schedule, and risk. And on this slide, who's looking at these things? Who is the CBARB composition? And you can see that it's the senior members of Headquarters Department of the Army. So this is actually quite important, and you can't slough this thing off because there really are important people uh, looking over your shoulder as you do, as they review your CBA. And finally, there is of course a process by which the CBARB does its work. And this slide says a lot less than what it appears to say. Uh, things come into the CBARB for review, they take a look at it, they make decisions, and they either approve it or they return it back to you. That's not very surprising. But that's, uh, that is in fact the process. The next three slides provide you resources where you can get more information. DASA CE has been very uh, uh, persistent in putting together good resources for you to use. I want to pick up the issue of where in the processes that run the Pentagon and the Army cost-benefit analyses are actually used. And so I'm going to take a look at three of the big processes on this and subsequent slides. On this slide, you see the three major administrative processes that really do run the U.S. Department of Defense. In the lower left in blue is what's called the requirements business, also known as JSIDs. In the upper green is the money business, which you may all be familiar with, the PPBES, Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution System. And on the right-hand side, there's the Defense Acquisition System, also known as the DOD 5000 system. I'm going to give you a story that indicates how these three things work, both together and separately. And this is a story about a kid who says to his mother, I'd like a new bicycle. And the mother says, hmm, you have outgrown your old bicycle, and you haven't had one in a while, so yes, you do need a new bicycle. And the kid, now excited, says, can I go buy one? And the mother says, no, you cannot. Why not, says the kid, because all I've given you says the mother, is a requirement. 
I don't know if we can afford it. I don't know where we're going to buy it. I've just, I've just validated your requirement. And this, in fact, is one of those organizations called the, J the JSITS process up at the Joint Chiefs of Staff that does requirements. They say, yes, we have a need for a new anti-submarine capability. Yes, we have a need for a new long-range artillery piece. But they don't say how to buy it or whether we can afford it. They just do the fact that we require this thing. Well, the child goes to the father who is keeping the checkbook in this family. In other families, the mother might keep the checkbook. But in this family, the father keeps the checkbook. And the kid says, can we afford a new bicycle for me? And the father, after due deliberation, says, yes, we can afford a new bicycle for you. Good, says the kid. Can we go buy a new bicycle? No, says the father. Why not, says the child. Because all I know is that we can afford it. I have no idea if you actually need one or not. And the kid says, mom said I need one. I have a requirement. And you say, I have enough money. We have enough money, so can I buy it? No, says the father. Why not, says the kid. Because in this family, Uncle Harry is the expert in bicycles. He knows where to get them, who's got the sales, how many gears you need, whether we should do it online or in a bricks and mortar place. When Uncle Harry comes, he'll help you with all this. For us in the DOD business, Uncle Harry are the major subordinate commands, whether it's the tank and automotive command that specializes in vehicles, or whether it's the aviation uh, support command, or sorry, the Aviation and Missiles Command down in Huntsville. It's the people who run the R&D and the procurement of weapon systems. So in fact, in the blue side, there's an, a JCS organization. The green side is the money business. And the right-hand side is the Army Material Command and all its major subordinate commands. So the child who wants to buy a bicycle has to go through this long drill. But in fact, so do we. We have all sorts of requirements that are placed upon us. And these things happen not simultaneously or even in synchronized motion. One of the things you should notice about these three intersecting processes is that JSIDS, the blue one, happens whenever anybody asks the question. A service goes up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and says we have the following requirement. Uh, the, the JSITS people chew on this requirement and they issue eventually a yes or a no. They issue it in various documents. So that happens as needed. Whereas the green, the planning, programming, budgeting, execution system happens on a regular basis. Budgets happen at a certain time, palms happen at a certain time, and even if they don't quite occur at the right time, they really are on a calendar basis. And the defense acquisition system, like the JSITS, happens as needed. The main elements of the acquisition system are what are called milestones, and they happen as needed. So two out of the three circles happen as needed. One happens on a calendar basis. And so these three gears are moving in different directions and in different um, speeds. And yet the process works slowly, clumsily, but it works. And we do produce good weapon systems. Next three slides provide some greater detail on the JSITS process. And you can see that it really is run by the purple suited organization at the Joint Chiefs of Staff at JCS called the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, the JROC. Once upon a time, each service ran its own requirements business. But in the interest of making things what we call purple, uh, there's now a Joint Requirements Oversight Council. Every bureaucratic process has got to have some output, and typically it's a document or a piece of paper of some sort. And the same is true about the JSITS process, which puts out capabilities documents. There's an initial one where they say, yes, you have a requirement, and we'll give you sort of a preliminary, basically initial, uh, capabilities document. Yes, you have an initial requirement for this capability. And later on in time, they'll say, you can go ahead and develop this project because you do need it. And when you're ready for production, 
There's yet a third capabilities document that comes from the JROC, which you see at the top. And later on, there's a document that comes from the JROC that says we've looked at the .MLPF. Do you know what that is? Doctrine, organization, training, manpower, logistics, personnel, and facilities. Sort of the full spectrum of, of what we deal with in the military to make sure that this new capability is okay along all of those uh, those axes. So the lesson you should take from this is that getting approval from this readiness group, sorry, the, re the requirements group, is not a one-time thing. It's a multi-time thing. It happens when you initially go for a requirements document, and then you get a, a development, and then a production, and then a dot MLPF. So this goes on and on and on. A larger picture of what's called the milestone process, Defense Acquisition Management System, which is the sort of right two-thirds of the picture here, and the one-third to the left, which is the JSITS process, gives you a larger uh, image of what's going on. And it turns out that um, there are cost-benefit analyses that take place inside this process, and that's the point of this section of the, of the briefing, that cost-benefit analyses play a role not a, a tremendous role in the, the JSITS process, but a much greater role when we get to the uh, to the acquisition process uh, to the right of the vertical dotted line. This is a slide that attempts to tell you what the DoD milestone acquisition process is about. You might think of it as uh, taking a project through its life cycle and thinking about it and what technologies you need to then building a few a few prototypes and testing them and then building a whole lot of them and putting them out into the uh, field to operate and support them and eventually disposing of them. And each one of these uh, stages is punctuated by a gathering of very senior officials into what are called milestones, milestone decisions. So on the left of the slide you see a milestone and you as the program manager are standing up before this milestone committee and you're answering the questions in those three boxes. The first one is, where are we? And rather than joking and saying, I'm standing right here, sir, what you really mean is, they mean is, what is your baseline? Now, every program manager knows there are three legs to the program management stool. They are cost, schedule, and performance. So the question you get as a PM at a milestone decision is, so what's your current status measured in those three dimensions? And then the question is, where are you going? What are your program plans? How do you know what, what, that you have achieved your goals? What are your exit criteria? And finally, they ask you, after asking where are you, what's your status, and where are you going, they ask you if there are any risks along the way. By the way, the answer to this question is always yes, because there are risks along the way. And you should give them the risks broken down by cost risks, schedule risks, and performance risks. And so those are the questions you're going to ask. And the stars next to those boxes indicate that cost-benefit analysis plays a role, and a very heavy role, in each one of those, uh, those sets of questions inside the milestone decision meeting. So then they say to you, you've answered the questions well, and they give you permission to go to the next phase. And so you do all this stuff, and you come before them a couple of years later, ready to ask permission to go to yet another phase of your project. And do you know what questions they ask you? Exactly the same questions as before. How are you doing? Where are you going? What are the risks? Because those are the paradigmatic program management questions. How are you doing? Where are you going? What are the risks of getting there? And so essentially what you've got in this process is a risk management tool. There is a regular meeting of seniors to say your program is okay or not, and you can go on to the next step or not. And it is called the DoD 5000 Acquisition Milestone Process. The next three slides speak to a piece of legislation that was passed in 2009 called the Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act, also called WSARA, W-S-A-R-A. And in that, the Congress said, roughly speaking, DOD needs to do more cost estimating and more cost benefit analysis so that this whole story of CBAs has now has got 
the imprint of the Congress and the requirements of the Congress and the necessity that the Congress puts upon us to do it. So when you look at uh, the actual law, they say to uh, to do all the things that are listed on the slide, and the things in blue have to do directly with cost-benefit analysis, and the things not in blue actually are indirectly related to cost-benefit analysis. If you look at section 201, look at all that blue. I'll give you some time to look at it, but you should know that there's just an enormous amount of cost-benefit analysis that's required per the Congress since 2009. Sometimes we jokingly say that this WASARA was the full benefit and employment act for cost-benefit analysts. The reports that the act requires from the Congress, more reports on top of the many reports that were previously required, also have to do with cost-benefit analysis. So the point is that the Congress got directly into the Act fairly recently, and they've said do more and more cost-benefit analysis, and therefore who are we to say no? And now I want to transition into some of the, uh, the tools and techniques that are very important in cost-benefit analysis. You will see net present value in other parts of this class not in my lecture, but in other, other lectures, and I put it here in my part because it's so important that I think it's worth seeing more than once. So if you know about it and are bored by this, I'm sorry. If it's new, it is worthwhile studying to, to understand what it says because everybody, and I mean everybody, does net present value as a metric for deciding whether a course of action is a good one or which course of action to choose from among several. We also want to pick up the issue of sensitivity analysis. That is, after you have a baseline answer, how would that baseline answer change as you alter some of the important inputs in the process? On this slide, you can see five different common types of quantitative financial decision rules for cost-benefit analyses. The bullets are net present value, internal rate of return, and so on. Each one of these financial metrics has its own computation and its own interpretation. And you might ask, why are there five different metrics? And of course, there are more than five. The answer is because these represent different facets of cash flows, and they don't always give the same answer. That is, you can do a cost-benefit analysis under one metric and conclude that option A is better, and under a different financial metric, that option B is better. So there's no universally accepted or common financial metric. By the way, there are also some non-quantitative methods, and you can see those listed at the bottom of the slide. Here's some more uh, cost-benefit ratio and financial metrics. There are lots of them. Different people use different financial metrics, although everybody uses net present value in one way or another. Without getting too fancy, as the previous two slides suggested, there are sometimes opportunities to eliminate courses of action because they are what we call dominated by other courses of action. That is, one alternative may be dominating all the others in the sense, as you see on the slide, that it has higher benefits and lower costs. By the way, cost-benefit analyses should be done in inflation-adjusted dollars and in present value or discounted dollars. On this slide, on this simple slide, we've imagined only two alternatives, courses of action A and B. And we've put them on a two-dimensional axis, two-dimensional axes of costs and benefits. So if you look at the upper left of this slide, you can see that A and B have the same cost. They're equally displaced from the vertical axis. So they have the same cost, but A has greater benefits. So there's no reason in the picture in the upper left to continue to consider option B. One can eliminate it and stick with only option A. 
we say that A dominates B. Similarly, in the upper right picture, we can see that A and B have the same benefits, but that A is cheaper than B. So in this case, too, course of action A dominates course of action B. We don't have to do any fancy net present value or cost-benefit ratios. You might think that with so many opportunities to find dominating strategies that uh, cost-benefit analysis would be easy. But in fact, the graph in the lower left in which A costs more than B but also has greater benefits than B is the case that one always, as an analyst, confronts. This is the harder problem, and it is the one that we are always challenged to, to take on. On this slide, I've left for you something that uh, you can put in your, uh, in your folder so that you see the various methods, the various uh, selection criteria, a quick description of each one, and when it's used. So this is a quick cheat sheet that one might, one might use. This slide and the next three speak to the issue of net present value, what it is, how it's used, and how to interpret it. In the box, you can see the algebraic expression for it. To back up a moment, you've done a cost estimate over the life cycle of each of the courses of action, which means you have a, an estimate of the cost for each option in year one and year two and year three and so on. This is the cash flow in year one, cash flow in year two, and so on. And these are indicated in the numerator inside the box as cash flow in time t. So for each option, one takes the cash flow at time t and one discounts it through the process of present value, which is achieved by dividing by one plus the discount factor k raised to the power t. And by adding them all up, which is what that Greek sigma does, adding up all those present values of the cash flows over the life cycle, you get the net present value. That's the, that's the algebra of it. Be careful. Net present value is not a budget dollar. It's not even a constant dollar that we use in analysis. It's just something that we analysts use to compare multiple courses of action that occur over time periods. No budget person, no congressperson ever appropriated an NPV dollar. If you show these people these NPV numbers, which are, by the way, lower than what you actually need in your budget, they may smile and say, sure, we'll budget to this lower number. People use. Finally, on this slide, we look at another financial metric that everybody uses, or at least everybody talks about, ROI, return on investment. And this is a very simple fraction, the numerator of which is the benefits that one reaps by a particular action or a particular option in a cost-benefit analysis, and the denominator is what did you have to put in as the investment. Typically, these are done in present value or net present value comp as net present value computations. That means you have to start by doing a cost estimate, reduce it all to a net present value in the numerator and a net present value in the denominator. That is the short and long of ROI. Other financial metrics that people use are benefit to cost ratios, where the decision criterion is at the top. If the benefits over the cost are greater than one, which by the way means benefits are greater than costs, then you should accept the project. And if it's less than one, you should not accept the project. There's also a financial metric called the break-even point. That is, if you gave me $100 and I gave you $20 back per year, there'd be a five-year break-even point. And roughly speaking, shorter payback periods are preferable to longer payback periods. But that is also misleading because payback analysis 
stops looking at what happens after the payback period is reached. And two possibilities could occur. After the payback period, no more payments might be made, which means you just break even, which is not a very attractive situation. Or maybe you get huge returns after the payback period, in which case it's a very attractive option. Since payback period only looks at how long it takes to get your money back and not beyond that point, it has a value in cost-benefit analysis, but it is a flawed metric. And it's more flawed than the other metrics, all of which have their own kinds of flaws. In this example, you can see that there is a payback uh, within six, at the six-year period. The most important note on this slide is that the various financial metrics used in cost-benefit analysis can lead to different conclusions. And so it's always worthwhile doing NPV first, because everybody does it, and then looking at other alternatives. There are now some backup slides, which I will not speak to, but rather let the student read on his or her own.